turn on uh, my screen. And want to talk, what, what's that? There, sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, so I want to talk about two primary topics today. The first was the topic of the video I had asked you to watch for Tuesday in lieu of class. On what subject was that video focused? Anyone? Yeah. Yes, Tothus. Toss, toss, yeah. I'm going to get this right someday. Yes, toss. state space. So what is state space? What is, what is state space? So if we have a model, we have a model. Um, Maybe I'll make it more concrete with a specific model. If we have our class action. Sorry, our model here. Maybe we'll make it SIRS uh, and have some potential, thank you, thank you. Some potential for loss of immunity. When we talk about the, the state space, um, what are we what are we talking about? If all the lights are on. Okay, yeah. So maybe keep the lights on up, up in front. Uh I think it's better if the lights are on in the back and not in the front. Well, what do you think? Uh, I think it's not bigger than that. I just you know. Oh, okay. For now, we'll keep it on here, and then we'll maybe reverse when we have to look at the screen. Okay. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Uh, so, so if we have a model like this, and we, we talk about the state space of the model, what are we talking about? We talk about a space. What's What does a point in space represent? Yes, Mark. One particular state of this model, right? Um, so for for this sort of model, it would be one particular value for S, one for I, and one for R, right? The number of people in S, the number of people in I, and the number of people in R. That would be one point in this state space. How many dimensions, nominally at least, uh, Naively speaking, how many dimensions would a big space with this model have? Three. three. And, and where did you get from? Where did you get three? Yeah, yeah. One for for uh, each uh, each of the state variables, so each of the stocks, right? So we'd have one for S, one for I here, and one for R. Right, and a particular point in this, and I apologize for the limits of of the board and two dimensional space, but uh, were a given point in this would have a certain value of i, certain value of s, a certain value of i, and you know so somehow you can imagine that being you know in the uh, in the board there, and it's going to have a certain value on the you know on the R axis. You can measure it to be well into the board and it has a recess value, right? So at that time, that uh at a so at some time, there's a certain value of S, a certain value of I as indicated by that axis and a certain value of R. Now if if this model were simulated over time for or progressing uh, how would that appear in terms of the state space? What would that look like in the state space? Well, it could be a, okay. I mean, you're you're saying it could look like the simple infinity or something, but uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, at a certain level, what you're describing with the affinity symbol could be more characterized by what? By a, it would etch out a curve or a trajectory, right? It would, it would sort of carve out some movement here. And it could be of different, different character. It might go something like that, where this is what's called an attractor. And it's, 
it's sucking it towards this attractor, right? So maybe it, it might start here, it would still go to this attractor, it might start here, it would go to this attractor, right? Um, there might be some areas where it moves away from it um, uh, because of, of some effect. People are coming in of a certain sort or something, but, and there might be some areas it moves to. Um, could there be some places where, for this model, where it it goes back and crosses itself and goes over exactly the same point and goes somewhere else. Sorry, if you are like far enough from this the top of the gate, the top of the gate, you can avoid this. Oh, okay, okay. So we're we're going to get to that. I love the way you're thinking. But I'm asking a more basic question now, and and it's somewhat hampered by this being drawn in three D. So I'm gonna I'm gonna imagine a model that is only two dimensions here. Maybe it's S and I. Right. Um. I'll I'll, I'll draw another model. Um. So. I don't want to get you confused between these two models, but I'm just trying to try to make some points which are a little bit easier with the two-dimensional model. So this is model one, right? Uh, and model two down here. Okay, uh, and we have two state state variables. How many dimensions would there be in its state space? Nominally, at least two. Good, good. Um, and so. One might be uh, an act, so there might be an axis for what? For what? Uh, so what might the x axis be here? S and I. Um, and here, maybe the model starts at a certain uh, high value for S and low value for I. There's very few people infected initially. And then maybe it would move up here and, and, and it might evolve further. Now, I'm going to add some degrees of freedom to indicate it doesn't always stay the same, but maybe it would, it would go towards a basin here. But my question here that I was asking is, could you have it loop back on itself? Could it go up and and sort of cross itself and stuff like that? If not, why not? Yes, uh, Eric? Yeah. Um, because at that specific time, you would have exactly the same conditions, so it always follows the same path. Got it, exactly. Yeah. So at a given point in state space, if this is the full depiction of state space for this model, at this point, some, as, as Eric said, some particular conditions apply, a certain state applies. And, and for these sort of models, deterministic models, if you're at that state, what does that tell you about how it will progress? If, if you have this value of, this, of these stocks, remember, stocks determine what? In general, what do stocks determine? They determine the flows, right? Or if we wrote it down as differential equations, as ODEs, ordinary differential equations, right? Remember that? We have like S dot equals, I dot equals. And what we have on the right-hand side here is some function of state, right? It might have been S times I minus S divided by something. What is it's a function of state, like it depends on state. The value of the, the rate of change of S, how quickly S is going up or down, depends on the current situation of the model, right? Right? This depends on the current situation model. In fact, in this model, it's entirely dependent on that. It's precisely determined by that, which is what Eric was getting at. So at this point in state space, we just plug in the value for S and for I, and we get a value for the rate of change of S. How quickly it's going up or down? Up. 
positive negative, down negative. And I dot it, the rate of change of I, right? We just plug in the current value of S and I, and we get a value for S dot and I dot, which tells us which direction we go from there, right? Right? If, if, if S dot is negative, we're going down in S. Is that, if I dot is positive, we're going up in I. And, and so the direction of the arrow, there's a unique direction of the arrow at each of these points. So it can't kind of loop back on itself and cross itself because that would imply for the same value of state here, it can go in different directions, which is not the case for these for these deterministic systems. You plug in the state, it tells you exactly where it's going to go, you know, what direction it's heading next. Do you, do you understand that point? Or if you want to see it in stocks and flows, and I appreciate that's a good alternative way of looking at it. If you prefer that to differential equations, perfectly good to work in stocks and flows. And if you plugged in a certain value for S and I, you can compute the value of the flow this way and the value of the flow that way, right? And it would tell you if, if inflows are greater than outflows, then it would tell you I is going up. And if outflow is greater than inflow, I is going down. And, and, tell you how quickly based on the relative, the net flow. And so the point is at any one point, you have a certain value of S and I, and it has, it will head a certain direction from there. Do you, do you get that point? This is an important point in state space. Okay. And the same thing is true with 3D. It's just harder to draw. Okay. Um, so is it possible, and this is what Mark's question, is it possible that we, we said we can't really have the trajectory cross itself here in any meaningful way for a deterministic system? Is it possible, however, that within the state space, there might be different attractors, different places it could go, for example? Maybe one here, one here, and one here. So if you're in this region, we'll go to this one. If you're in this region, we'll go to that one. If you're in this region, we'll go to that one. Is that possible? I bet it's possible. These are called basins of attraction. They're a little bit like, you know, there's this place in the uh, Columbia ice fields. Has anyone here been to the, been to the Columbia ice fields? In, in, uh, uh, Alberta, British Columbia. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, it's it's really interesting place to visit. Um, uh, they you could see the catastrophic impacts that climate change was having on the melting of the glaciers uh, as well there, and you can see they have it's very moving. You can see they have markers for where the glaciers were in you know, 1965 and 1970 and 1975 and 1980. And actually, I, I'm not sure they go back with quite that granularity that far back, uh, but uh, certainly through the 80s, 90s, 2000s. And you can see, you know, when you were born, the glaciers were here and now they're, they're right up there. Um, and it's going back really, really far because of, you know, the the, the uh, success of toll that higher temperatures and change precipitation patterns are having on the glaciers. Uh, it's, it's a dire sort of um, a, a dire warning to this area, which depends on glacial water and the Bow River and, and ultimately the South Saskatchewan and North Saskatchewan rivers for irrigation and drinking water and other purposes. Um, but in the Columbia ice fields, there's these. It's, it's right near the Continental Divide. Does anyone know what the Continental Divide is? Uh, yeah. Water outside of it flows into one body of water. And, and on the other side, it flows the other. And that term is used a lot in the US, but in Canada, it's actually uh, rather uh, more involved yet. There's actually a place uh, that's uh, in the Columbia ice fields where literally within a couple hundred meters of it, a drop of water going down one side 
We'll go to the Pacific Ocean. Brian said it. Going down another side, it will go into the Gulf of Mexico. And going down another side, we're going to the Arctic. I see the one Gulf of Mexico. There's, there's another place in Saskatchewan. Well, but, um, but there we'll go to Hudson Bay, which ultimately goes into the Atlantic. And uh, and then another one will go to the Arctic coast and up. Uh, so I think it's the Athabasca River and so on. Within a couple hundred meters, we'll go in these different directions because they're different basins. It'll draw down and empty in those different areas. Um, and here we have similar thing. We have different basins. You can think of this as the Atlantic, you know, the Pacific and the Arctic or something like that. And a drop of water started just on this side of that will flow to here. Another one will flow to here. Another one will flow to here. Um, so we have um, we have we can have multiple basins of attraction or multiple sort of repellent things, things that are that are pushing out um, uh, or attracting. And you can have what are called limit cycles, where it cycles around. Uh, what would it mean if we have a, a limit cycle? What would it mean if you have a sort of periodic orbit, as it's called, around a certain point? You can get these in ecological systems very readily. A, a certain orbit that goes around this point. What, what is that going to correspond to in terms of how this system would behave? If it goes around and around, you know, back to the same point in state space, keep on going around. What would it correspond to here? Delta, I mean, the gradient, the difference is by the year, year will it will be zero. Uh, no, there will be places where the derivative of, is zero. That would be a, a station point, a, a fixed point, a uh, an equilibrium where everything's in balance, that none of the values of the state variables would be changing. So those are key points. But, but this circle, Around that will correspond to something different. What does a cycle correspond to in state space? Yes. It's going to be like a dynamic equilibrium. We kind of have oscillating values for this. Yes. And dynamic equilibrium is sometimes exactly what we we call it. And, and so it's going to be oscillating values. It's going to be going in some sort of periodic way. And there's close cousins of this model. Oh, pose one for you. Where you do get these sort of persistent cycles. Um, uh, you can get it like if there's a real slowdown in health services as the result of lots of people being infected. We saw an example of this in an agent-based model. And as a result, more people get infected and it drains susceptibles and then very few. And, and, it, and it just sort of cycles around and cycles around and cycles around. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm drawing this for these deterministic models, these, these models that are, are stock and flow models. How would it look different for an agent-based model? Yes, uh, uh, so Rushiel, I think you're in the dark there. I can hear this be just, a, just more kind of okay. Yeah. Okay, why why do you so so the term chaotic is one we use with a certain amount of care in dynamical systems because it actually means something it's a, it's actually a technical term just like complexity. We talk about a system being and I'll be with you in a second, uh, pilot. We talk about it being a complex system if if uh, there's literally um, a divergence between, you know, f of a plus b is not equal to f of a plus f of b. There's a nonlinearity that prevents this from being true. The whole is greater than or different from the sum of the parts. Uh, it, it exhibits dynamic complexity in its evolution when that's the case. Um, and chaos is actually used technically to mean a system which it started from very, very nearby values, may go to very different outcomes. 
and and you can't get that like like here where you know it's different but we have these systems which just recurrently are like that they're they're chaotic and one of the things that's really interesting about them is they look almost random in their behavior but you're being fooled by your eyes because there's a hidden order to them and if you know with the right lens how to look at it you can immediately see, oh, there's tremendous order there. And the right lens is a state to be. And uh, this is a pretty good way for you to construct it. We'll get to it in, in a few minutes. But so, but they do look kind of, it, it, to use a vernacular meaning of, a sort of common meaning of, of chaotic sort of disordered and what we call it in medical terms, ataxic, it kind of um just kind of crinkly. They 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 look jagged and and sort of and and not very not very smooth and nice. Uh, they look they look kind of like they have a lot of what in uh Thailand. You were going to say something, Joe. Uh, I was going to say, like, the dimension has like a very high nominal. Dimension. Yes, you're on it. You're on it. Awesome. Um, so, so there, there's really two big things. Rochelle's picking up on one of them. Tyler's hitting on another. And I'd like to talk about these and to, to enfranchise this class more fully. Those who here in person, I'm going to move over here, and I'll ask Wade. Uh, Wade's accommodation to take a photo of this in, in just a minute. But let's suppose that we have three individuals. We have three agents. Let's imagine a very simple agent basis, the three agents. Imagine that each of them, for simplicity, uh, so we have a state chart, and each of them can either be susceptible or infected hmm? at a given time. One or the other. We three agents. How many states, how many possible different situations are there? We call the state of this system. How many different possible states? How many different possible situations are there in that model? Uh, yes, uh, is that Nicholas in the yeah. back? Yeah, I've got man, I've got to get a pair of them. Two to the three. Two to the three. Yeah, because the first person could be in one of how many states? Two. And then the next person could be in how many possible states? Two. And the next person could be in one of how many different states? Two. two. So it's two times two times two, or two to the third. And in general, if we have n states, How many different possibilities for if we, well, if we have N state, N, sorry, ah, what am I doing? Sorry, N agents, and we each agent has uh, S uh, different, different possible states that, possible states uh, for that agent. So here it's two. If we have three states, it could be three. If it were these three and then another state chart with two, uh, we express it in a nice factorized way, but it's six possibilities. Uh, if we have S different possible states per agent, um, for each agent, how, what's in general the number of possible states the system could be in? Yes, so be it. S to the N. This could be big. Imagine if you have five different uh, infection possible states, say for COVID-19, susceptible, pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, uh, or oligosymptomatic, as it's more commonly called, and, and then uh, fully symptomatic, and then a recovered state. 
there'll be five, and then maybe you keep track of whether or not they're in the hospital or not. Two possibilities there. Five times two is 10. So you get 10, and if you have 100 agents, you get 10 to the 100th power. It's the number of possible states here, right? Mm. And you can imagine drawing a diagram where each axis is the value for one of those agents, its value, but it would be, be you know, the number of dimensions equals the number of agents, which is scarily large. So Tyler is exactly right. This is a massive dimensionality. Um, to sort of visualize it alone would be a, a challenge if you have more than, you know, than two agents, right? Uh, or three agents. Um, yeah, so we, um, we have a very high dimensional space because of the combinatorics. The set of possibilities can be astronomically large and even modest states, age of population. But the other part is one that Ruchil, of which Ruchil spoke. And, and why does that, what is the evolution of an agent in state space here? If we were to draw it out, even with two agents, we might, we might get a very sort of um, uh, funky, sort of crinkly, sort of evolving situation here with their evolution. Why is that? Because we have for H based models commonly what? Sorry? Stochastics. When I say stochastics, what do I mean? Randomness over time. It's flipping coins all the time to figure out what each agent does, right? So over here, I said that you can't get crosses in the, you cannot get a situation where it, the path crosses itself. And an age based model could you? You actually could, because this way, this time it might go this way, this, this other time in the same state, it might go this other way, because it's not just dictated by state, it's dictated by stochastics. Do you get that point? There's a, an element of chance in it. It's flipping coins or rolling dice, and it might go different directions in the same underlying situation. It's not the evolution is not just dictated for the current state of the system. Do people understand that? Okay, so I promise from this seat a couple minutes ago that I talked with you shortly about the state space lens that helps you identify hidden order caused, for example, by a chaotic system. So there's all these things that, if you look at them, they look random, but behind it is a very well-ordered, very well-structured, simple-looking system. The logic can be written out in very simple terms. So it's descriptively complex, but mathematically, it can be described very and very with a great deal of brevity. And I told you that when it comes to applying that lens, or I, I hinted that. When it comes to applying that lens, um, you can you can apply it to empirical data, the data we collect from the world. Now, you know, in a, in a perfect world, we have data on S, I, and R, and just be able to write down that data, and and we'd have a description of the state space of the system, and we can see how it evolves and. Notice mathematical characteristics and 
Uh, if, if the world was that easy, we could often, you know, we could come up with very nice mathematical descriptions of these systems. But the world is rarely that, that simple. What we are have is grab bags of different different measures. So when I was unable to make this class on Tuesday, I was delivering an address to a across to a national panel. We had a couple two hundred fifty attendees or so uh, on uh, applying sort of. Models we're talking about here, but with the, with machine learning and data science woven in, and we were talking about different measures that the health system uses or that are available. But, but health system, what are what are some things that are that are data reported about about our systems in, in the world when we have a pandemic going on? What are some things that are what types of data might be uh, available or reported out? Um, for us to, to know about. Yes, Tom. Yeah, number of, and, and often that's number of like, newly diagnosed cases within the past X, maybe X is day, maybe it's week, right? Um, so that's a very common one. What's another one? Yes, uh, Avi. Number of healthcare workers as part of the system that we're speaking. Ooh. Uh, I, were it only so, uh, I I would love to see that. Um, we like to be able to try to work towards estimating that, but that's actually a hard one. I'm actually looking for ones that can be measured like on a frequent basis. That's a very important one, but it's one that requires a lot of analysis, savvy analysis to arrive at. I, I welcome it. It's a point of you know, of interest, how many healthcare workers are required to keep the system of equilibrium at equilibrium, but but it's it's one that a lot of people wish they knew, but but it's it's not easily available. But what are some other things that might be reported? Yes, is that Nicholas in the back? <laughs> yeah, hospitalized number of hospitalizations. Yeah, number of new hospitalizations. Good, good. Uh what others? Yes, Ruchia. The, 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 the location of the infection. Yeah, so, so location of where infections, uh, like if there's been an outbreak in certain regions. Yeah. Um, uh, good. And and there's a variety of others. I mean, we, you know, if, if you're working with the healthcare system, I was working within the healthcare system since I was borrowed, seconded, as to the way to, uh, for a year to year and a half, and we, um, uh, you know, we had further access to not just new cases, but uh, but number of new deaths, number of new ICU, so intensive care unit, um, people entering intensive care unit, people uh, entering the hospital, discharges from each of those, us people leaving them, but we also have have deaths. We have uh, and we have wastewater data. For for some of this measurements of of of, of viral load from west wastewater, um, we also, uh, as Wade knows, um, you know, have looked at a variety of additional indicators, like from social media reports of people saying, "Oh, I just tested, you know, positive of my rapid antigen test." They're not going to call it into the health system, but it's reported on social media. Um, you might have uh, data in some cases from uh, specific, uh, more more specialized areas like uh, long-term care facilities, uh, uh, caring for elders, and so on. Now, when we have these things, they're a grab bag of different measures of an underlying system. Um, it's not exactly reporting the state, but we use them collectively to try to give us an understanding of that state, and from that, try to understand where the system's going and how it's been evolved. Now it turns out that these systems, I've shown it SAR system, but I, it extends well beyond that. These systems are coupled systems. What do I what do I mean here by this is a coupled system? Anyone? 
I'm sorry. They're interdependent. Okay. They're interdependent. So the evolution of S, does it depend on I? <laughs> that it depends on I. Does it depend on R? At some level, yes, right? It's 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 maybe not uh immediately obvious there's no term and for the evolution of s that it's multiplied by r plus r but lots of immunity it, it's coming in right um even if that weren't there if the r were really really big few of their contacts would be with in fact it's a lot more will be with with uh, recovered individuals so this and and we can go on for i and for r it's a cop set they're coupled they're <laughs> If one depends on the other and vice versa, right? Um, and that has big implications for the data. Why do I say that? I didn't go into it in detail in that video, but I talked about it some. What is it? Uh huh. Yes, Tyler. You know, a couple values can you define some of the others possibly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and look. In general, if if I see that I is growing really, really quickly, does that tell me something about plausible values of what S might be? Does it rule out certain values of S? What, what value do we know S doesn't have if I is growing like any bus is? We can't, it can't be zero, right? And chances are, if I is going like gang buttons, it's doubling every two days. It tells us the number of susceptibles is what? Sorry. It's going down. It's going down, but right now the value of the number of susceptibles is quite low, quite high. If, if I is growing like crazy day after day, what does that tell you about, about the availability of susceptibles? It's quite hot. If, if I is dropping very, very quickly, day on day, it's really dropping, that whispers to you that the number of susceptibles might be what? Low. Hmm? If susceptibles is dropping really quickly, what does that tell you about the value of I and, and S here? I is, is I can be zero? The number of susceptibles is dropping super quick? No, the only way susceptibles will be dropping if what? In terms of flows, if what? If it's, it, a stock drops if the, uh, is greater than the inflow. Yeah. Um, and so that means the number of new infections is greater than the number of, of people losing immunity, right? Which means infections, if, if it's dropping really quickly, infections must be quite large, right? So it's actually telling us something about the number of new infections. And in order for infections to be quite large, we're not going to have zero infectives. We're going to need a significant number of infectives to be infecting that many people. Now, I'm, I'm throwing up my hands just really quickly at these, but the implication <laughs> here is profound and it's profound for data science machine learning and it's profound for modeling so the issue is that when we have a coupled system like this information about any one piece actually whispers to you it hints to you about the rest of the system too it, it contains information about the rest of this. And if you have data on just a couple of places in the system, you might think, well, there's no way. This, all, we, all we know is like measuring this and this and that. There's no way we can know anything about what's going on beyond those places in the system. But you would be wrong because the system structure, the way in which it's configured, that the logic of the system <laughs> means that you measure those couple things 
you're actually hearing about many broader areas of the system. You're hearing about other areas of the system you didn't measure because they influence this area, right? It's kind of like if I, if I had, you know, this door were suddenly open and I had just massive numbers of people flying into this room here, flying <laughs> and, 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 and uh, coming in to, to attend this lecture, or maybe it was really about the lecture. Uh, I would say, well, there's, there's probably a lot of people out there. You know, um, there's likely to be a lot of people out there. And it turns out that informationally, you can glean about lots of areas of the system from measuring any one point. And this is the result of what's called Taken's embedding theory. So the guy, there was a mathematician, great mathematician known as Floreth Takens, and Takens embedding theorem. Okay. Um, and what he showed is that for broad class of these systems, if you measure from one point in the system systematically, say day after day after day, you were to measure the number of new cases. And you were to do what's called an embedding on them. Um, and basically, it's creating vectors where we have the value today, and the value yesterday, and the value the day before, or the value today, and the value from two days ago, and the value four days ago, and the value six days ago. You create a space. I need the value from today, uh, yesterday, uh, and two days ago. Um, right? And it turns out that if you plot those points, each of those points is just reconstructed from I alone, but measured today, yesterday, two days ago. And you were to plot those out, you get something that, with some conditions, is basically a stretched version of drum roll, please. The state of it. You reconstruct. For one measure over time, systematically taken, the state of Now, <laughs> that's a profound result, but it has some practical challenges. Amongst other things, you don't know how many dimensions should be in this space. Do you do it with three, as I've shown here? Do you do it with four, five? <laughs> but it turns out it can give you great, great insight. Uh, about the structure of the state of So we have ways of trying to figure out how many dimensions we need. But, but here's the thing. For those who are interested in things, the deal is any one point of these coupled systems can tell you about the broader system. Hmm? And if you have several types of measurements about the same drawn from the same general system, They're not solitude. They're not independent of one another. They shouldn't be viewed as just arbitrary time series, each interesting on their own. They're speaking to you about a common reality that's underlying all of them. Hmm? And, and this is what we're dealing with with a lot of data from the world. It's a mistake to view it as independent time series. So they may nominally be about different things. This is the number of new infections. This is the number of deaths. This is the number of new people entering the hospital uh, because of COVID. You, you can treat those as, as somehow independent time series to analyze each in isolation, but they are speaking to you about a common system. It each contains information on the others. It contains information about broader areas of the system. Hmm? Hmm? When we have coupled systems, their underlying state space is whispered to us by even in systematically collected information on, on just one piece of the system. If you collect on several pieces, you can do even better. Really this turns out to be really powerful. 
for helping us understand where the system is going. <laughs> Reconstruct an approximate space space. And then work with that reconstruction. Let me ask you. Riddle me this. If I take a minute, maybe it's measurement of in factors. And I create vectors of value here. So here's the value today. Um, so I'll, I'll call it I at time t, I at t minus now, that's say one day, two day, how could be one for, for one day, uh, two for two, two days or what have you. Um, uh, and then I of t minus three tau. If I, if I took measurements from the world of the number of factors, and I'm going to put it in a vector like this for each day, for each t, I create a vector for the next day, another vector, the next day, create another vector, the next one, another one, just like that. And I want to plot it out. Does that depend on a certain model? Is that is that specific to this model? No, it's based on data from the world. It's nothing about this model. If I reconstruct the state space with that, and I I see some curves in the state space, which you will see. Is that are those curves about that are specific to to uh, the current, you know, to to one specific model. The answer is no. Um, it's it's not specific to a certain model. Um, so I don't know if you could get the light switch for for a minute. I'm sort of a couple of people back there, but um, I can you share your screen online. So oh yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so blah blah blah. Um, here we are. You got something like this number of cases today, number of cases uh, one day ago, number of cases two days ago. And you got these successive trajectories of the system. Uh, and you get, it's actually somewhat noise upon data, but data leads to more fair problems. And and it's only coded by when it was collected. Uh, and what you see is evidence of successive trajectories associated with with different outcomes. This model, or the, excuse me, this reconstruction is just based on empirical data. Data today, data yesterday, data tomorrow. No, oh, two days ago. And I can do it in four dimensions, et cetera. Is, it, is this specific to a model? Is this specific to a certain assumption about SDIR, SIR, or SIRS? Or is this specific to an agent based model or, or a system dynamic model? No, it's specific to none. It's model free. And some of my colleagues are want to call diagrams like this hurricane. Maps because they plot it out successively and they they then project them forward. Um, uh, this this from uh, UK, for example, with new cases in the past week and change in case week, uh, the, the, the change in the, the case rate compared to the preceding week. Or you can plot it out in a graph like this or, or a successive graph like this for hospitalizations in Britain. And and here again we have color coding by how long ago it was, um, but these are model free representations. They're they're not contingent upon. They're not privileged. They're not hanging to their validity on any one model. They're based, based on data. But given a representation like this, you can project forward in the space in the way you might project the trajectory of a hurricane forward, right? Trying to understand where it's going to hit land, for example. And hopefully, you don't have a bad present with a sharpie. 
screwing it up. Um, yes, that's probably lost in your youngest. Um, anyway, you 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 have these trajectories that have structure to them that you pick up in this state space. If you measure it with enough dimensions, um, turns out to be what's called diffeomorphic too, but basically it's a stretch squeezed version of, of state space. It's, it's a reconstruction of state space. And you can reason in this reconstruction a way that's independent of all. So this class is not per se a, a class that looks at the data science implications of system science. But I do teach a separate class on that, which um, uh, you know is all about looking at the world from the perspective of a from a systems perspective, from a perspective of a couple of underlying systems, and looking at data from that perspective, and using that perspective to enrich our understanding of data, give us suggestions for the appropriate lenses to use in this data and to give us insight as to how systems might evolve. So we can do these sorts of graphs of state space with our models, but some of the biggest, most promising applications of them lie in other areas. And Wade here is a um, uh, notable practitioner for having, having done work looking at deducing causal structure systems, for example, um, using methodologies that are ultimately rooted in, in these approaches. And you can also do them to project forward, et cetera. Um, that's all I have time for on this particular subject, but what I'm speaking of, and perhaps we could get the lights on again there. Um, thanks. Uh, you don't want everything to fall um, uh, But perhaps that you know alerts you just hints at, perhaps whispers at, this intersection of system science and data science, just one of, of the areas that they come together. And within this classroom, in the next two days, we're gonna be talking about more intersections of data science and system science. Um, particularly when it talks about, when it comes to uncertainty in terms of models. So I'm going to uh, transition to that topic. I'm gonna